I'm going to divide my talk into two sections. Uh, the future of forest and forestry in Nova Scotia is almost a section in itself and it causes me to, to go back a little. And then what I'm going to do is, 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 is we're going to take a little break and please stand up if you have to, those seats are kind of tough. And, and ask a question if I don't explain myself well, my wife's not here to go cross-eyed when I say it the wrong way. Um, and, and uh, you know, I don't pretend to be anybody better than anybody else. I, I, just, uh, I just have been working at this for a long, long time. So I'd like to give you a brief review of, of policy and history that I think is going to influence the future and some basic realities to set the stage. And, and we'll just go to the next shot. The world has now got more than 7 billion people. And that is affecting Nova Scotia, even if we tend to live in a bubble here. There's no prospect of human re population regulation. I think the world could sustain probably two or three billion of us in a reasonable fashion, but we can't maintain, nor can the rest of the world attain, the consumptive lifestyle we live here. I say this with just, just feeling like, like we're about 6% of the world's people in North America using roughly 60% of the world's resources and we think it's normal because we were born into it. So that's a reality. Violent changes like clear cuts and agricultural land clearing have destabilized the land. What we've done essentially is, is, is get rid of a broad diversity of things and we've converted the, the land into something that produces commodities, often one or two. The agriculture and, and forestry industries uh, have a willful focus and simplification to a few commodity species, and that's created tremendous losses of species richness and diversity, which actually acts as a buffer. So uh, the next thing is that there's a study out of Harvard about Mass uh, Massachusetts, and it was called the illusion of preservation. And the reason they, they called it that is that they discovered that the consumptive the level of consumption of the people of Massachusetts was more than the forest could sustain. And they tried to rejig it so that they, the, the, it was sort of self-sustaining within the thing, and they couldn't. It just didn't, uh, it just doesn't jibe. So when you set a piece of land aside in a place where you're taking too much, you're basically just transferring the pressure to cut somewhere else. And there's where the illusion of preservation comes in to some of these things. So. Um, I, I, we don't know how much we're cutting here but it, because we're feed, feeding a global economy, but I think we're in trouble in that way too. Basically, nature's inherent safety checks have been destabilized as a consequence of, of the first four points that I've just made. The fallout includes things like increased rates of insect eruptions, flooding, and epidemics. This is not natural. We've created rivers that flush like toilets where they used to rise and go down slowly. I'm going to be in Middleton on Monday talking about that. So the other thing that's happened is the nutrient losses and the soil abuse has become rampant. The goodness of the land since the last ice age, which is only 11,000 years ago. Now, when I was a kid, 11,000 years sounded like a lot. <laughs> Not so much any now. So. And what we seem to have now, and this is not as optimistic as I'd like to be, is that we have industrialized politics policies, and politicians. What can I say? Better just move on. <laughs> Natu Canadian Geographic magazine is a relatively benign magazine, and back in 2002, 11 years ago, they ran a, 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 a comp composition of climate change projections. And the purple areas are are uh, the areas that are projected by about five different studies that are sort of normal to, to have had forest growth back in 2002. And the reason I'm showing you this is this is what they predict is going to happen by 2050. There's basically a line going up the, between New Brunswick and, and up the border and then from Quebec up to James Bay. And these are going to be areas where antelope will grow, and there'll be trees growing along the edges of the valleys where there's enough water, and the rest of the higher land is going to be arid. It's just a little food for thought. I'm not saying this is true, but that's what 
some of the science is coming up with, and, and we're certainly not really preparing for it. Uh, the next thing I'd like to talk about just briefly is the fact that there's been a series of policies. And of course, we only live so long, and I'm near the end of, of my time here, but the one I remember first of all was a very thin document written called Forestry, a new policy for Nova Scotia. It didn't scan well, so, so I didn't try to put it on the computer. Written in 1986, Ken Stretch was the minister, and there's a few pages about forest policy here. And one of them said, we should have less clear cutting because it's not suited to the land. And nobody did anything about it, and we just kept on clear cutting. Um, the next thing I'm going to show here, some of you may have attended meetings around the province. There were quite a few of them, a couple dozen, about uh, done by a voluntary planning, where they wanted citizen input into four new strategies. There were parks, there was biodiversity, there was minerals, and there were forests. And uh, there was a, a very strong message that came out of that. They were, they were well attended. Uh, there should have been a good discussion paper because a lot of people came af fearful for their jobs if they were in the forest industry. And a lot of people came and didn't want to have any forest cut, which if you use toilet paper is kind of foolish. Um, so what I found in, like in, 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 in PEI, they actually came up with a really, they came up with a really good uh, uh, document before anybody even came to any meetings that had showed that PI was mostly skinned down at about 1900. There was hardly any forest left at all. Uh, uh, be between the shipping that they built, they cut wood to build ships and, and the agricultural thing, and it's actually grown back. So there was a lot of issues that were actually well, well documented there, and we didn't have that. Uh, essentially, the second step, it wasn't really phase 11, it was phase two. That's just the way the government write, wrote it. Uh, was 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 called uh, um, a natural resort. Well, there was, there was this strategy essentially had recommendations, and I was the head of a forest panel that was supposed to make recommendations to government for a new for a new forest strategy. To say that rather awkwardly, and we wound up with three recommendations being made by three different parties. Um, I'm not sure how much I should say about this, but uh, there was a. a, a prerequisite that we were supposed to actually collaborate and there was a mandate for change from that first uh, uh, go around that voluntary planning had, the phase one. Uh, the person on the uh, forestry uh, panel who was from industry had no intention to change whatsoever and wouldn't collaborate. I'm being very blunt here but it was the truth. I lived through it. So two of the three panelists wound up coming up and I was one of them on a, a document called Restoring the Health of Nova Scotia's Forests. And, and uh, uh, basically, I'm gonna, just going to keep going here. This was the overall document that had the parks and the minerals and the biodiversity. And this is what a forest looks like in case you didn't notice, folks. A pile of wood. I don't know how the bobcat or the lynx could fit in there very well, but that's what they portrayed it. And I knew we were in trouble when that came out. The next thing that Forest Products Association did, I'm a woodlot owner, I've been, uh, was that they basically commissioned a gentleman in, 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 uh, in Maine to criticize the document I just showed you that, that Donna and I wrote. He said we were like first year college students and had no education except by the media. He basically, I, we could have sued him for libel, uh, we, which would have cost too much money. I'd rather put the money into the woods. But uh, what it did, effectively, was scare all the woodlot owners in this province. They, they broadcast this thing widely through the Forest Products Association and through other forestry things. And they got most of the woodlot owners scared that we were a couple of idiots. And, uh, uh, and, they, and people didn't want change. Well, they didn't get change. And the guy who was on the committee lost his job on the pan forest panel. But then the government hired him, and he's still advising them. So I'm not sure what the moral of these stories are, but it's just a reality that, that, that plugs into what's happening right now. The new document came out in, in, in 2011. The government, we, if you remember, through all this foggy stuff I'm talking about, we were supposed to make recommendations. The government was going to take something and do something with them. Not much that we recommended was reflected here. I think I wasted about 10 months of volunteer time. Uh, the the, the it, there's 10 pages on forests in there, 
And uh, the other document right here is that there were 11 forest reactions they're going to take. But uh, I think it's safe to say the term sustainable really means keeping the mills with a steady supply of wood at whatever environmental cost. I wish I didn't have to say that. And, and right now, you may not, well, you probably are aware of it because there was a, a barge that went ashore in, in the harbor, Picto, and it was from Anacosti. And they're bee training wood from New Brunswick. And I won't get into all the nuances here, but we're just getting what we can. And they're giving a million dollars out to put new roads in on your property if you want to cash in your woodlot. And, and, and so it's just, uh, we're basically overcut. And, and there's a lot of, 30-year-old wood being accessed now. If you see the size of that stuff on the road, it, it's, a, it, it's a amazing because the provincial tree, for example, is the red spruce. And I brought a book along that was just put out by Tree Canada saying that red spruce mature at 200 years and live for 400. Well, I guess the question becomes, why are we cutting them when they're 30 or 50? I don't understand it. The other thing that's happening is the Abercrombie Mill, to the best of my knowledge, uh, taxpayers have about a $90 million in there that's due back. Port Hawkesbury received about $150, $125 million to keep it going. We're propping these, these things up. This is incidentally the not so fun part of what I'm going to be saying. But there's a reality here, as much as one likes to be an optimist, that one has to face. And a friend of mine who I saw two nights ago, has portrayed, he's a forester, and he portrayed this is what's going to happen with this biomass thing going on. Um, essentially, there's going to be 650 wet tons. Now, there's about two tons to a cord, if you can count the count a cord, if you, but if you, those of you that are woodlot owners can think cords, they're going to be used annually in Port Tupper, and about half of it is going to come from the woods. So there's an enormous amount of biomass to generate electricity. Now the spin doctors are down, some of them are down at, at the Museum of Industry today. Um, and they will tell you if we talk about this that, that, that you know, it's going to be a good thing and it's going to provide uh, for 30,000 homes in, t in terms of electricity. First of all, I'd like to tell you that the, the conversion rate to burn the forest, to, to produce steam, to turn a turbine, to produce electricity is 21.5% to produce electricity. Now they're going to use the heat on the side for the processing, but the 30,000 homes is an outright lie, and that's what both the federal and provincial governments are doing these days. The 30,000 homes represent an amount of electricity that, in fact, this mill will consume itself. So let's not say that it's going to do 30,000 homes. Let's say it's subsidizing. We're cutting the forest down to heat, to provide heat to the mill, and and to actually subsidize the power bill that the mill has. That's what it's going to do. Uh, the volume agreements are going on. Uh, basically, Northern Pulp right now has just been given another 100,000 tons to take out of the Annapolis Valley. And talking with some of the people in the Annapolis Valley, I just gave a talk at MTRI not too long ago, they don't know where it's going to come from off the Crown land. And they don't want trees, older trees, because then they have to sort them. They'd rather just have this new stuff and mow it down. So it really does seem to be, and I hate to say this, a race to the bottom. I've been trying to listen carefully to both sides for a long time, and, uh, and I'm afraid that's where it's going. The result of this is that DNR policies, and let's not just blame the forest industry, but DNR have been displacing wildlife for decades. This is a scene around Kedji and the Tobiacti Wilderness Area of recent clear cuts. Now, if you're a pine marten or a moose, how do you get out through that? You know, the scale of it is, 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 is and, and uh, to, to, to be blunt about it, uh, some wildlife species adjust, but a lot of them just quietly starve and die. They don't get in the paper. And I think Nova Scotia's plundered forests and wildlife need and deserve a better vision than the wordplay and cheap thinly veiled definitions designed to disguise clear-cut conditions. You get the soil dried out, the sun hits it, and things that used to grow in Nova Scotia don't grow there anymore, and it's gone on for a long time. If 12% of the land base is eventually protected, 
Should, should industry and contractors be allowed to severely re degrade the remaining 88%? I knew when the front page of that document came out after a year of work that I, how do you put the, the, the biodiversity together with the fact that they consider a forest to be a pile of wood? Nova Scotia and its wildlife need ecologically healthy working landscapes to, con to connect protected areas. We can't just, there's not enough, there's not enough in the 12% in the to, to make things healthy and, and things have to get around in order for the genetics to work out. This, is, this shot was taken two days ago. Um, and basically uh, the gentleman sent it to me. And that's what we're dealing with now. It's, uh, I think the rebuilding healthy forests would actually provide long-term jobs and, 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 and promise more stable financial returns. And I'll show you what I'm going to do in, what I'm doing in my own woodlot, and that's, that's what I, where I think it would go. But when you, this reminds me of actually flying over the prairies, <laughs> the conversion that's, been, that's gone on. So I think the forestry bus has long been driven by industry, with governments aboard for the sake of the jobs, has left a and it's left a trail of a lasting environmental destruction that continues to this day. The public is outraged, particularly with the large clear cutting on crown land that they think we have an interest in. Most of the woodlands are destabilized, nature's ability to heal has been crushed or reduced, and we f keep forgetting that we depend on a healthy environment. It alone actually sustains us. I would suggest that the bus driver needs new, new orders, in a new direction. In a democracy, decisions are often determined by the majority of the minority who care deeply about an issue and, and by those who show up. That's why I'm happy to be here today. In, in Nova Scotia, we had 110 environmental groups gathered for a press conference about this in a march to the legislature in April 2011 to protest ongoing forest practices after nothing changed. The government industry ignored us and they ignored the science. I was putting this much riparian science, that's the lands along waterways, how they should be managed on the table, and the industry person on that panel would just say, nope, that's just the way it was. Billy, if you want to drag me off screaming right now, you can. I, <laughs> I do have a better part to talk about. But uh, I think it's time to, turn, to think beyond short-term profits and jobs. When I took my training as an FSC, Forestry Stewardship Council person, the skidder would go by with four logs and one that was worth 600 bucks at the mill. That's how you make money, not by 20 bucks a ton. The other thing I've got to say, and you, you've given me a chance, I feel, you know, nobody's thrown anything yet, but I really believe that single species management is ridiculous. It's getting to the point where the industry's having trouble with it because how do you manage for moose? I served on that mainland moose recovery team for eight years. We didn't do one thing for a moose. When we couldn't get money from government, I got money from a company I was working for, $50,000. There was no mechanism for them to accept the money to do research. So what we need to have is essentially, we need to manage the forest in a way that generally provides the essential elements for most of the animals. Ecologically healthy forest. And there are ways to do forestry and do that. I, I, I feel a little concerned about this. At this stage in my age, my best before date is probably uh, something I should be keeping an eye on. But for example, Scotland, where part of where I was born, uh, was, was once a treed thing. We tend to think about deforestation in, in tropical areas, but Scotland was once a treed country. It's down to about 3%, and half of that 3% is, is actually plantation, which I don't really count as a functional forest. It's agroforestry. So the future of forests in Nova Scotia, if the government industry have their way, amounts to a ton by ton race to remove what remains. And I'd like to quote one line from the, the, the 46 pages that, that Don and I wrote. Without an intelligent shift away from current practices, we will continue to degrade our forests resource and lose the mag multitude of social, economic, and ecological benefits that a healthy forest provides. To summarize, industrial strength forestry is too hard on the land and wildlife. And nobody in government is stopping them. And I'm sorry to be this way, but that's what I see. And 
if you're wondering, you haven't asked any questions, I was uh, given an award by a bunch of people in Truro two nights ago, and one of the DNR employees came right up to me and said, thank you for what you do because nobody in government is saying anything about the industry. That analogy about the bus and the industry steering it and the government along for the jobs, you got to think about what, if, if you guys work in, in the industry, I mean, I've got logs that are going to be worth something on my property after 38 years. Not, and I manage lands for other people, and 20 bucks a ton, you can't buy fertilizer. You might as well put it back to growing a different, different kind of tree, as far as I'm concerned. So, I think what I'd like to do now is reboot. I'd like to take a break, if we could, and let everybody get up, and I'll put on the second thing, which is m a much more positive. <laughs> but uh, I certainly set... You know, uh, yeah, yes, go ahead, make a comment. Sorry, I don't want to interrupt you. Just no, <laughs> that's all right. While you're on this topic, I wanted to ask a couple of questions. Would that be all right? Sure. Uh, can, can you tell us what that says on there? I can't read it. Oh, it's, a, it's actually a joke. <laughs> it's, it, and it's supposed to be animals. And is, is that you, dear? I mean, where do you find anybody in a, in a wasteland like that? If you're a bat, you can't fly across this. They, they go up river valleys and they need trees as eco to eco-locate. So, so it's kind of a joke and it was sent to me after I got this award. And, but the, the, the gentleman who sent it to me uh, shouldn't have sent it to me. But he just, he, he, and he made a, made a joke out of it. He knows how, how much I, I appreciate the, the picture more than the rest of it. Yes? You can't say five because there's difference. There are really deep, rich soils, and there are shallow, rocky soils. And there's a thing called podzil formation with acid rain, where you wind up with this hard pan forming underneath. Mm -hmm. So it's not as simple as that. There's an awful lot in this uh, whole forestry thing. It's not like a fellow uh, by, the, by the name of Jack Ward Thomas, who uh, in the states he said, you know, uh, forestry isn't rocket science. It's actually much more complicated. <laughs> But, but, and it is, it is. And that's where I have to be careful with what I say because, and a lot of biologists, uh, you know, oh, you can't prove this, you can't prove that. Well, after the number of years I've been in it, I've, I've looked at it long enough and seen enough. But the trick is, and I'll show you what happened in my own property, all the goodness of the land that's coming off my neighbor's place is still running into, th down my brook, five years after they clear cut. And there's only so many nutrients in the soil after 11,000 years, and, and basically you're right, and for example, calcium deficiency is a serious issue in certain soils. And phosphates, for every ton of wood fiber that comes off a site like this, you get about six pounds of phosphates actually in the, tr in the, in the bowls or the, the trunks that are removed, and that's, in many places, that's very low. So what you're basically saying is that y it's, it doesn't take very long and very many removal times before there's not enough left to grow well. And that's where I'm mentioning in, in Scotland they combine cutting with, with grazing. And that's happening in parts of Newfoundland now, too. And of course, in here, uh, I'll show you in a few minutes, I mean, there's, you've got wild animals that graze. It doesn't take domestic animals to graze either. So, any other quick uh, comments? Yes? Um, yeah, this, this 50% reduction in clear cutting that the government talks about. Mm -hmm. What they really mean? Does it mean anything at all? Um, they have, if you read the definition, you can have 30 centimeter high forest is the same as a, a real forest. Um, that's why I mentioned and I said some pretty strong things there about playing around with definitions. My understanding right now is, and I'd, I get my information a lot from, from people who are in a better position than me now that I've, I've been out of government since... Oh, 99. But uh, they keep, people keep informing me about what's, and there's supposed to be a new definition coming through because everybody threw up with the one they came through. Uh, basically, we had three definitions, depending on how technical you wanted to get in, in what Donna Croslin and I put for in, in our phase two panel report. And uh, there are plenty, the common sense here is that, that a lot of the very valuable trees grow where there's some shade. They're capable of establishing and waiting until all of a sudden something comes down 
and then they're already there, like a yellow birch or a sugar maple or whatever. Now, some soils can't, produ can't support them, but a lot of them can. And, and the whole idea is they can get going. Balsam fir will do this too, but they can't wait as long as a yellow birch. Or, so they're sitting there waiting under this canopy, and then somebody falls down, and all of a sudden they're already there to shoot for the top. And that's when they grow their nice, tall, straight trunks. When you clear everything off, everything wants to grow out sideways and you don't get as good a tree. There's an awful lot of common sense that isn't in what's being done. I would call a tree basically something that needs roots and soil, like this gentleman suggested, and it's, got, it's a photovoltaic panel. So it doesn't make sense to cut all, down the, cut all the photovoltaic panels down. Keep the energy coming from the sun, you know. But uh, this sort of logic doesn't seem to prevail with the people in, in government. And the industry is interested in the dollar, in my opinion, from what I've seen. So anything else? Any other comments before we move on to lessons from the land, which is going to be a little more fun? Yeah. Let's take a break. Yeah. Thanks, Bill. Yeah. That's great. OK. Now, this is a good example of, uh, it's, just, it's in Pictou County, of, of what the forest used to be like. And, and essentially, I start off with this in, in, because it's not that we have to go back to the past. You can't turn it back. But it worked very well. And there were a lot of, so many valuable trees in there that uh, within a week of when I found this place, the company was going to put a road in and cut it. Um, it doesn't look like much until I show you my friend Ann Camozzi standing right here. There are little trees, big trees, medium-sized trees, different tree species. And, and, and uh, basically, it's a pretty good setup. Now, I have to be careful when I say this, but that's my head sticking out of somebody's white ash. <laughs> <laughs> and about six of us could get in there. <laughs> One of the things I say, I, I, the Mi'kmaq came after me when I got to government many years ago, and, and uh, one of the things I say is we don't let our trees become elders anymore. In fact, I mean, a lot of you folks are, are, are already sensitized, but a lot of young folks don't even recognize that trees can be this size. Um, I had a, a film crew from National Geographic that showed up uh, less than two years ago to talk about coyotes. They, they landed in Halifax Airport. They drove to my place in Palmka, just past Anna, east of Anaganish. And as I say, we came to talk coyotes. The first thing that Ryan Doyle, the chief cameraman, said, he'd been, he's a world traveler all over the place. He said, what's wrong with your forests? They're scr scrawny and scruffy. And we grow up in it, and we think it's normal. And they actually tried to bash that down because they clear cut around it, but it, it held up. We have a history that goes back about 400 years. I can't get my thing here. I'm going to have to be a little, anyway, excuse me, I shouldn't go on about it. I'm supposed to be a preview thing here that's not <coughs> working. But uh, uh, I don't think that uh, any of us really understand how much physical effort it took to, to move into Nova Scotia, come by ship, and clear the land. And when I see, except when I see those rock piles in the woods around here, I, I was a regional biologist in Pictou, Anagish, and Guysburg County, and I found things up on the hills that just makes you wonder how many backs were worn out. So I'm not saying, but we have a history of, of this. The forest itself lived for eight, about 800 years between disturbance factors in a lot of places. People think of fire, but actually a lot of the fire that you find in the carbon and the blackness in the soils is because of the burning that took place when the land was cleared. So, so it was a, it was a, a tough job, and, uh, but, the, but the pace of it wasn't like what I just showed you before. That's, that, that's the point I have. And, and, and so, sort of too much forest flattening too fast for too long, if you will. Mm -hmm. Now, for those of you that know Frank Muse, the chief at Bear River, uh, I spend time down, down in the western part of the province. Uh, and uh, uh, I use this slide. Um, there's a lot of things to say with some of these slides. But I'll give you an example of, 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 of what a lot of animals about 75% of the wildlife species in Nova Scotia actually wind up liking to be close to some body of water, whether it's a little stream to get a drink or, 
or but so they like like being close to water and that's not hard in Nova Scotia let's face it you don't go very far before you find some so the other thing is that the laws are saying things like 20 meters if you're clear cutting you have to stop 20 meters well the average songbird territory is a hectare which is 100 meters by 100 meters now how do you fit that into a 20 meter strip where you've got blue jays and crows and raccoons and everything else wandering along in that very thin strip and it blows down anyway so it's it just doesn't add up common sense wise what what the existing rules nobody pays much attention to them in terms of charges and and I'll show you that in my own place but really when you get right down to it I had a hard time sneaking up on this one but <laughs> but uh, you, you need animals need things just resources just like we do they don't call them resources they actually have reasonability a lot of them do uh, the more I've studied animals the more I have respect for them and, and uh, uh, basically uh, they need have requirements just like just, as I say this this is a, a yellow throat warbler and they select a certain kind of habitat and they'll they'll fly south and find a similar type of habitat you'll find a fly catcher that uses tall trees overhanging the water will use do that down down in, in Central America and then they'll try to find the same thing up here so uh, but what well, this is a this little bird right here is it is a, an oven bird it's a it's the one that goes teacher, 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 if you will, in the, in the woods in the spring, and it's very loud. And they're an example of a species that actually lives, needs a mid-forest condition. They need to be into the woods some distance to get away from the blue jays and the crows and all that sort of thing because they nest right on the ground. It's like a medieval oven. That's where they, I guess they call it an oven bird. But you can appreciate that that's very vulnerable. And although we have them, very few of the nests where they're, where they're nesting in just little fragments of woods are, are successful. So there's a whole host of, if we're caretakers of the world, and I think we've kind of made ourselves that way whether we want to be or not, uh, we aren't doing very well. Um, when I became a regional biologist and moved up this way, I looked around for land for a while and finally found a place where I thought I could be happy and I bought this in, in, in 1975. This is Pomkett Harbor down here. And I got about 56 acres, and I tried to build a house in Laside Hill facing south. And, uh, and, uh, and, but the land had all been cleared. But the trick was, I talked too much, as you know. So I decided I was going to do a lot on my time off. And the land went up in the back, up to the top of a hill, and down, back down here. It had all been cleared, except when in the old days, they would leave a hemlock for the for the cattle to get underneath on the pasture. So there were hints as to what was there beforehand. And, and I knew after cruising this place that it would be fun. It was mostly agricultural, but, uh, and I kept some fields because I have, I have every expectation that somewhere along the line I'm gonna to have to be growing my own food or at least doing more than going to the grocery store. And, but the forest looked like this. And it's essentially, it's, it was disturbance trees that had grown in at the same time the land was abandoned, probably back in the 50s. And it was poplar and wire birch, for those of you that know your tree species. If you do have a piece of land, you, it pays to know what you're looking at. And white spruce and that sort of thing. And it had grown in too thick because the roots were fighting it out. And, and they were fighting out for light as well. And the first thing I had to do was do a lot of thinning. A deer could walk by 50 feet away and you couldn't see it in the woods that I, I sort of inherited. But you could pick the best, and where there was a relic species like sugar maple or hemlock or whatnot, you could favor it. And it worked out that that worked very well. The other thing on the property, once you get above, there was a swamp, a wooded swamp that they made into a pasture, and they trampled the brook to pieces. But above that was a nice little brook with a meander pattern. Those, each time that brook changes direction, it's, the water slows down, so you don't get erosive force. That's how nature keeps it all together. So, and it was all softwood trees, which acid needles don't do much for the food chain in the stream, but hardwood leaves do. So I was very fortunate that I wound up planting a lot of hardwoods, and then the spruce beetle came along and took all the softwoods out. <laughs> and I didn't take the softwoods out, I just downed them and, and let them rot. But, uh, but uh, that was a lot of, that's been a lot of fun. 
The other thing that happened was the brook was all silted up. And when the leaves fall, there's literally tons of leaves coming down a brook or a river. Uh, and, and, and they'll all go down the ocean or to a lake if you don't have a rough bottom. If it's all silted in and smooth, all the nutrients, it's sort of like an October fest of, of nutrients that happens in the fall for the stream life, the bacteria and the insects that eat the leaves and all that sort of thing, they, they wind up needing to eat these things, but if it just washes by, they don't get it. So I, I did a lot to restore the waterway as well. And of course the goal I had was to bring back a variety of, of, of species to this very small brook that you could step on either side of sort of thing. Well, the first thing I did was to go back to, to the, that disturbance forest and, and, and start making holes in the canopy to favor the species like the hemlock here so that, so that um, it would get a place to grow. In other words, I didn't want to wait. I knew I wasn't going to live long enough. to If, if, if trees live 200 to 400 years, the kinds you're talking about, you've got to, nature will eventually do it, but it, it takes, it, I, I wanted to see it faster. And, and so the spacing thing became very important, and, and the choosing thing became very important. Whoops, I'm going the wrong way. And of course there were a variety of, of, of the whole idea was to break this up, get more species in there, and, and get more age classes in there. And, and uh, where there was some difference, I, I obviously worked with that very, very closely. To bring, to bring them back. Now some of this was really easy. For example, there was some white ash on the property and one black ash. And, uh, and, and essentially what happens is, the, the seed, there was two years ago, there was a fantastic seed crop. Now they'll, they'll, they'll winged and they'll go some distance. So all I had to do is basically go under the poplars and create little spaces. And, and I've got an ash forest growing now as the poplars die off. Poplar is a wonderful tree for rough grouse or partridge and, and for beavers and things like that. I don't want, well, I'll always have some poplar. Don't, uh, uh, there's no hate campaign going on here, but what I want to do is reestablish a more long, long lived forest. This, these actually, some of them hold their seeds until the winter comes and then the seeds blow on the snow. So they can go 500 meters or more through the woods and, and reestablish somewhere else. Now, the irony for me is, uh, I have, I have a group, a crew that I fed this morning. They actually sit and wait for me to, after the snowfall. Uh, but I have, I have a crew of blue jays that plant my oak trees for me. When I first got to the property, there were no oaks at all, but there were little ones that kept being browsed off. And, I, and one day I was out canoeing in the harbor, and there was some land on the harbor with an island that, that had old oak trees, and the blue jays were ferrying the acorns to my place for the winter so they could eat them. So the trick is, you feed the blue jays in the winter and they forget the oak acorns. <laughs> and, and then you go around in the fall and, 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 and cage these things so they don't get nibbled. And that's what I'm just going to go into now. This is the scene on my front lawn. And uh, so we have lots of browsers around. And they basically, when you don't do much with them, uh, and you don't hurt them or anything, they're kind of curious. They, follow you around a bit and whatnot. But if you don't have a cage around the tree, that's what I call bonsai red maple. <laughs> Any fresh sprout is, is groomed off. So I've developed a technique over the years of, when I'm reestablishing the forest where there was no natural seed of, of, of having to put up uh, uh, actually electric fencing uh, poles with a zig in them. You have to do a, a way that the animals can't lift it up and, and, uh, and, and three foot high, I use three foot high just so I can reach in uh, and, and, and tend them. It takes a lot of work. But I literally have thousands of these and I've spent thousands of dollars doing it. This sounds insane except that once they're all up and, re and, and, and growing their own seeds, it'll self-perpetuate itself. So it's a case of bump starting nature again. But we shouldn't be waiting for all these things to be gone in the woods. I mean, where, where there's trees like this left, they should, it shouldn't happen. So here are our browsers again, beside the front of the house. And uh, they're fun to have around. This is a, for those of you that read Saltscapes, this is Red Rabbit. Uh, well, it was easy to tell him from the other snowshoe hares yeah. around. And he just as likely come towards you as, as back, because we don't have a dog. We only had a guinea pig. We don't have a dog or a cat to, ch to, to try to kill him. The other browsers that were difficult, I'll admit, are, are porcupines. They can really do a lot of damage. And, and, uh, 
and the really uh, the biggest browser and the other we're the biggest habitat manipulators but beavers can really do a number on you uh, along waterways some of you probably know somebody that had a cottage that they came to see and there was a uh, a bunch of trees around the cottage that wound up either on the roof or on the ground and uh, that one's eating a, a, a white pine right there so uh, in some of the work I do we wound up uh, this is my wife and uh, we use four foot high welded wire mesh and it's got to be held into the ground again and that's about 250 bucks a roll so you, you really if you're going to protect what you plant it gets pretty expensive around waterways where there are beavers and there's an awful lot of beavers around. <laughs> so, uh, so we do that to get that established. That's, that's how it works. A fencing staple will hold that down, for example, on a tree like that. It works real well. Now, the other thing that happened here was uh, the other shot was taken over here. And, and there's the tidal marsh that comes up to here. There was a section of hardwoods. And then all of this 9, 12 acres was, was, uh, was this wooded swamp that they made into pasture and just grown up in willows and alders. And, and this is where all the brook that I showed you before was trampled, so it just went everywhere. So that became a little bit of an interesting challenge. So here's Alice again on top of what became an island. And uh, we decided we were going to gather the water that was coming down through this land and, 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 and then basically get it to flow out. Now, I don't believe in dams when it comes to this sort of thing uh, because I wanted the fish to come up from the harbor, and they did. And, and this is what it looked like just two years later. Uh, it's a fairly big area. It's five and a half days of digging and excavating and all that kind of stuff and hauling. Uh, but what a place to have just in front of your house. And it sort of restored things and did, it did its job. And meanwhile, I've been, I've been gradually getting the brook back together. And I went out and, and actually transplanted uh, ac aquatic plants from, from nearby ponds and whatnot that were locally in Antigonish County. Um, the amount, just just uh, a few days ago, I washed a mink for about 20 minutes wandering around poking his head or her head into different places. It's great fun. I guess I have to tell you that um, the neighbors decided they were going to clear, clear cut and they went to a millionaire contractor and this is a hillside down to that's where my line is right there and the brook was just a couple of meters inside. So I learned the hard way in 2007. We were nominated as the Eastern Woodlawn Owner of the Year by DNR. At the same time the neighbor just contracted, I won't go into the glowing detail, but this, you might recall that 2007 was a very wet summer. And for this went on for four months and there was just basically a slow motion mudslide down the hill. Those trees are all blown over now because when you do something like that and there's a south facing aspect to it, they don't, they don't stand. And they were also part of a very thick forest that they didn't stand up. This is what happened. This is another pond that I built. It was totally silted in. Um, I, um, I, I have to tell you that environment wouldn't come when there was an episode of silt. DNR wouldn't enforce their own rules. They cut within nine meters of our brook and it was big enough that they should have stopped 20 meters away. Uh, nobody was charged and DFO said there were no fish here. So it, effectively you, we've heard a lot about uh, uh, the, the federal government sort of dismantling a lot of this protection. I'm not so sure the protection was there. I had DFO out here and they were more interested in seeing whether I grew marijuana on the land than they were. They kept disappearing into the woods every time there was a little trail. Well, we have all kinds of little trails, but we're not growing marijuana. Anyway, um, here's the house up here and here's the, here's the tidal marsh and, and all that silt, uh, just tons and tons of all the goodness off the land just came down there and still is five years later. So if you're building aquatic parts on your property, I suggest vernal pools <laughs> where there is no running water. <laughs> and this is what this is. I have a, I'm a biologist with a backhoe. I believe we've we, we got we to gotta have forestry. We want to have agriculture. And, and, and we, we, we just got to be careful. The message here is not, not to do things. The mas message is to be, be more careful. And, and uh, I, dug, I dig a small hole about nine feet deep and I watch it to see whether it holds water or not because we have a lot of clay soil, but some other people, nothing stays. So, so I, I dug this and then, then later I bring in an excavator and, I, and I, I dig it out. If you put, 
it all in a pile beside here, the muskrats will come and, 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 and uh, under, undermine the whole thing and, and it won't last for very long. There's all kinds of little tricks that I'm not going to get into, but the reality is that these things, if you can get the right site, they'll fill up and they'll stay. And a lot of the salamanders and, and, and uh, all kinds of frogs, toads, this sort of thing, their eggs don't get eaten by fish in a, in a situation like that. So that's great fun too. And here's a four-toed salamander. About, they don't have lungs, but they breathe through their skin. But they, this was about a couple of days before, before uh, it was, it was going to walk off into the woods. And they're fairly rare. And uh, we've actually moved them half a kilometer through the woods into new ponds where, from a place where they were quite vulnerable because the rac it used to dry up and the raccoons would get them. The other thing you can do on a, if you've got a forest that only has young trees is to, is, is, is to put up some nest boxes. And this sounds terribly simple, but you know, I've had flying squirrels in them, and flying squirrels actually eat fungi that is helpful to trees, and then they excrete the fungi. So, and for example, I put up flicker boxes, and flickers, I have a fire break around the house that I call an orchard, and, and I'd worked in agriculture for a time, and up to 30% of the insects that cause trouble in an orchard that uh, are removed under the tree. They pupate, the insects eat the, eat the apple, fall on the ground, pupate in the ground, and the flickers come along and pick them up. So it's really useful to have, I had bumblebees in this particular one that I'm just showing you, but, but that's a great way to bump start getting, getting the diversity back. And there's a flicker, um, and they just make a hole like that in the poplar tree, and, and uh, that's a male, he's got the mustache. If you paint that off, the female doesn't recognize him. And the next year, you might wind with flying squirrels in, in that hole. A neighbor of mine uh, called me uh, one February day years ago when he said uh, he, he just cut this tree down, minus 20 or something. There were 35 flying squirrels, one red squirrel, and a bat that came out of this broken tree when it hit the ground. And you'd never find any, any regular red squirrels that many together. They'd all fight. But flying squirrels are another matter. And, and the, that hole's become really important in the woods. So here's uh, what might happen the next spring in that flicker hole. That's a sawwet owl, very small. People call and say, I have a baby owl. And uh, it'll use that site. So holes and trees can be a really useful thing. And nest boxes can bridge the gap until you have them. Uh, a quick story, in late February uh, to March, you wind up with a, a, a owls hooting in the back of the woods in the woodland, in which, which we did many years ago. I get, went out and kept looking. This is a barred owl, a fairly big owl, and uh, brown eyes, easy to tell. And, but I couldn't find where they were nesting. And after a while, I realized, it took me a terribly long time, I'm not any more intelligent than anybody else, really. Uh, I got to the point where I understood that they, didn't, they had a territory and they were making a living, but they couldn't breed. So, up comes the next box. Up goes the box and uh, had to put some it turned into a raccoon clubhouse for a while. <laughs> so I had to put some stovepipe up and clear some trees away. But the barred owls have been there every year since. And they're kind of fun. They actually come and hoot by the house when they, when they come back. They came back uh, uh, about four weeks ago. So, and they know you. In fact, I've had to stop my chainsaw work because they come and complain about it starting in May. <laughs> now, they'll just come and hoot. I'm not kidding. So I just leave a... And I have, I have, oh, there's all kinds, anyway, too much to talk about. One of the really nice things about an animal like this is they do recognize you just like eagles do. And chickadees don't. They'll land on anybody and want a seed if you train them. But other birds, are, and this, one, to me, it's really wonderful when an animal like this will see who you are and then turn around and look away and you don't represent a threat. That's a real compliment. The other thing that happened after the clear cut I told you in 2007 was that they, they cut down a, a goshawk nest, which is a yellow listed species. They're a really fierce bird. And, and they cut the nest down with young in it. And I told them about the nest and they did it anyway. They, made, they probably made you know, $10 off the tree. And they relocated that same year, this great big nest started being built. Well, the, the pair used the, the failed year. Uh, uh, building a big nest for a hawk is a, is a very in energy intensive occupation so they re, they rebuilt uh, so now we got we got a lot of displaced wildlife on the land and and uh, they're doing okay but with the rabbit population low for example it's been a challenge and this and that this is a young goshawk 
So um, I can't plant in the spring near that nest site anymore. They've actually been known to land on your face and bite part of your nose off. So, and I don't blame them after what happened to their nest. <laughs> this is what a male goshawk looks like. They, they, they could roar right through thick trees for a big bird. It's absolutely amazing. I just, it's just incredible. I've got lots of stories, but I better just keep it down here. One of the lovely things about the, this time of year is you can wander out and find out what's around. Stories in the snow. These were otters. And I began to realize that I didn't have any dens. They were wandering through the woods near the brook looking for den sites. So I have, there are good contractors, forestry contractors. They, and I have a, a couple of them. And the, the one, one of them, I, I put it to them, would you, would you save some of these trees? Because if you cut it down and leave it, like this one's actually cut down in a clear cut and left because nobody wants to buy a hardwood tree that's mostly whole for firewood. So he saved me a bunch. And we, and easier said than done, drag them off into the forest and cover them over with brush and leave them there. Well, you wouldn't believe what happened to the mink population and the otter population. There's, there's down in front of the house. And uh, boy, are they kind of fun to have around. They're tough on the fish. But, uh, and I've got a little bit of a story to tell you there, but, but uh, this, they don't know that the docks for us. And it can actually, if you don't even see them, you often you see the wet spots where they've been sunning themselves on it. And they have territories, and they'll come around every couple of weeks, so you can look out for them. They're, they're fun. They're really, really kind of fun. And interestingly enough, uh, last year, my wife was up. We do a lot of woodlot tours. My wife was up in the woods, and she and some other people saw a mink go by with one of the salamanders out of the vernal pools. And I was photographing this mink at the house at the same time, chasing a chipmunk. <laughs> so we really have done something about getting the, getting the wildlife population going. It wasn't fun for the chipmunk. <laughs> now, you know, DFO said we didn't have any fish. This is an example of what the otters were doing to the, to the fish that, that came up from the ocean. I didn't ever, never stalked it, cut the tail off back. What was happening was the three, those three or four otters, I think there were four otters in that picture I showed you, they'd actually just herd all the fish into the shallows and then massacre them. So I saw this otter hauling this big limb out of the pond. Of course, the pond didn't have much wood in it because it was built, it was dug. And so I turned around and I took a piece of plywood and got a whole bunch of big limbs and some old steel and weighted the whole thing down, put it on the canoe, took it out to the 10 foot deep section. And luckily the canoe's not there, <laughs> slid it off and didn't, didn't take the canoe with it. And now the fish have places to hide when the otters come. You really kind of got to just w stunning nature is great fun, and, and, and I've kind of equaled the odds here. When you think about it, if it was a natural pond, mm -hmm. trees would have fallen in over time, and they would have had a place to hide. So there again, it takes me time, but I had a hard time talking my wife into, uh, in, into uh, following me at a discreet distance with the chainsaw work that I do and, the, and whatnot, until the very first brush pile that she built right here. Uh, and, and the next morning, there was the bunny, one jump away from, from being able to get away. And after that, she's been fairly helpful in terms of, uh, and what you do there with the structure is you actually use large pieces underneath and cover it with fines, and that way you wind up with lots of space for animals. And even some of those birds will actually, in the, before the leaves come out, they'll have a first crop of babies in a, in a nice protected spot like that. So I gotta say that, uh, I've been pretty optimistic and I've been fairly fortunate. This is the site on the back of the property, a protected hillside, and I built a bear den. I should tell you right off the top that I, I planted apple trees in the woods as well as in my orchard many, many years ago. So there's dozens of apple trees which attract everything from the rough grouse or partridges, people call them to you know what. So one day I was here and there is, there is all of a sudden I knew two years ago, and, uh, and the den was being occupied. Last year, some of you ever heard of McPhail Woods and PI? Gary yes. Snyder? Last May, Gary came over. He wanted to see what, what I've been doing. And, and essentially, we went to this site, and I was going to show him where the den was, because I thought the bear would not be there. We walked down over the hill a little bit past there. The den's just below, and she asked us to leave. She, she, she didn't growl. She actually had a plaintive bleat, 
but she just was right there and she bleated twice. She had a cub and she didn't want, if it was a young male bear, she would have, we've seen her. She actually, but, uh, so I had to tell the neighbors to please keep the dog food and the garbage and, one, and there's been no trouble now for almost two years. But I believe we need to make a place and there isn't a lot of places now anymore. And it's, I, I couldn't believe it when, I actually, when it actually happened. I mean, this is so much fun. So we have water shrews that can run across the water about three meters. I actually saw it happen and I wasn't drinking. <laughs> and we have bears and we have almost everything in between. Now the goshawks are pretty tough. The goshawks are pretty tough on the ducks in the pond. So you, there are these trade-offs, but that, again, that's nature. I don't feel badly about it. Yeah. I worked at DeBert for a number of times on this 1,200 acres where the, 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 the First Nations evidence is, goes back 11,000 years. You wouldn't believe the bears. Whoa, great fun. Anyway, I, uh, I, I'm growing really good trees. They're going to be worth something to somebody else, but I'm also leaving trees. You know how red maples all sucker and there's umpteen pieces coming up and then they, they work against each other? Well, they really produce cavities quickly. And, and, and uh, so I, I'm, I'm saving the very worst that'll make a hole, and I'm cutting some, but I'm saving the best. So there's selection cutting that can be used in a variety of ways. There isn't one way. I just have to say in, in passing that, that holes in the ground are really worthwhile too. And uh, woodchucks are, uh, I'm not a particularly new age sensitive guy, but that's my bedroom window and there's the woodchuck. <laughs> and when you're getting dirt thrown on the window, you know you've got to, we're sort of burn, I'm burned into the side of the hill. Uh, but, but, you know, the skunks live in those, the rabbits live in those, the snakes wind up in them. There's all kinds of things that old woodchuck holes will, will do. So, so that's just part of the picture as well. I also just want to say this is the coyote that considers our property to be part of its uh, ground. I was really pleased when Billy wrote something about coyotes a while back with a friend of ours. Um, there were uh, two deer down on one field when this picture was taken, and there were rabbits down in the alders. And I really don't want somebody to get 20 bucks for getting rid of this animal because he is not a problem. His tail looks a little funny because he basically uh, it was changing from winter to, to summer coat when the picture was taken. But, you know, you ever see that movie Jaws? Some of you? The, I know normal people who would never go in the ocean after that, seeing that thing. And that's what I'm sensing with the coyotes is just because one or two people get challenged by coyotes, usually they've been fed. The coyotes have been fed by people and they ex have an expectation. People, I know ordinary, rational people that are, that are scared to go in the woods anymore. And, and believe me, uh, it's, you're safer in the woods than you are probably going home on the highway today. That's just the way it is. And I won't go on about it because I don't want to sound too didactic, but don't ruin your enjoyment of the woods and all the spirituality of the woods and everything else because you're afraid of an animal. I made my wife, she just is an artist and she wanders off in the woods alone when I when she first started hanging around my house about 17 years ago, finally I said, look, take a knife. And, and uh, she said, why? And I said, well, if you twist an ankle, you can make a crutch and get home. But the other thing is, you've got to have an attitude. If you ever are challenged by these animals, make it troublesome. Don't be afraid. Like a, you, get, you see a big dog and it's growling at you. There's a tendency to be afraid. They can sense fear. Just get mad. And, and uh, I've actually had, uh, I was... And I shouldn't go on about it, but I have been, I have been uh, tested uh, and working, I was working three days alone in the woods uh, with, uh, on, on Mi'kmaq First Nations land on a thousand acres doing a wildlife inventory and a coyote tore, came right at me and I thought it was a mistake. At the last second it turned off, but it, they come at about know, 55 kilometers an hour they can run. If I had a gun I wouldn't have had time to load it. And, and ultimately uh, I thought, ah, oh, I wonder what I thought I was, probably a deer. I just stood my ground. I didn't run because animals like this will perceive movement that interests them and, 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 and running or something away can trigger a, a, an aggressive response. But they're very opportunistic animals and they're walking on eight foot high fences between um, yards in, in, in downtown Los Angeles, checking out whether there's a cat or not. So um, basically, um, one has to be careful. I, I, knew, I, I should finish off that story uh, and tell you basically I knew that there was a problem when the coyote came at me the second time. <laughs> it really didn't have good intentions, but it chickened out again. So make yourself big. Don't act like you're 
and, and you'll be okay. And th these animals, like I say, I believe the ones that are causing a lot of trouble in Cape Breton Highlands National Park have been fed and have an expectation. So I just want to say that I think in closing that there's all these animals we share the planet with that are so much fun. These guys are back out looking for each other right now. Um, and we build rock piles. And uh, I had to move a rock pile uh, a number of years ago. And it had three kinds of snakes. And that particular species there on the red belly, um, they eat slugs. So th they're a good thing to have. We have a greenhouse, we have gardens. You know, they're, they're very helpful to sort of bring the balance of things back a little. So the easiest thing I ever planted was a high bush cranberry. They, birds ignore them in the fall, but b by February or so, they're, apparently they're, they're not so bitter or something because the next thing that happens is the birds are all eating them and you wind up with the, with the seeds being excreted with a nice little fertilizer packet, if we should, you want to call it that, and I get cran high bush cranberry all over the place. So, so basically what I've done is, is plant a lot of things that are useful to a lot of animals. And ra the raccoons kept getting the, bird, the, the hummingbird feeder, so you wind up planting a series of flowers that look nice as bergamot or bee balm. And, and uh, that sort of gasses them up before the hummingbirds leave for the south. So um, at this point, I've got 43 tree species. Uh, I've combined the native species that are suited to the site with the climate change predictions. That's a walnut tree. It, they're squirrel magnets, be forewarned. But if you've ever bought a piece of walnut, you know what the wood's worth. So, and they grow very well now. So uh, great fun. I want to give close off with uh, the first part of my talk. I believe we can change things, or I wouldn't be here today. Um, this is George Archibald. He grew up in Pictou County and moved down to the St. Mary's River. And here he is in Baraboo, Wisconsin. There were, when he and, and, and Ron Silly got out of college, he's the same age as I am, back in the 70s, they decided they were going to start working on, on the whooping crane. And I, and George actually danced with a female named Text who was imprinted on people. She didn't, wasn't interested in her own kind. George is an interesting character. But he, Ted Turner picks him up in an aircraft and they go to the Koreas to, t to negotiate over, over the demilitarized zone because basically that's the only place left with wildlife habitat in, in, between, in, in Korea now. Without digressing, this man is a one-man fundraising. He's on the Platte River in Nebraska right now. We emailed as recently as last last week because we've become good friends. Um, he raises between six and eight million dollars a year, private funds, to sustain uh, uh, satellite places for cranes. There are 15 species of cranes all over the world. Right now there's one Arab sheik that's got 500 black-necked cranes. You lose five cranes for every one that you get alive when they're exported out of Africa. And it's just incredible what people are doing to wildlife. When you start thinking about the, no, the things you do for your ego, excuse my bluntness, but, but so George has got, and, and in order to solve the crane problems, I think I've got another picture or two here, those are the whoopers, they were down to about 17 or something at one point, and they're up to in the hundreds now, but in order to solve the crane issues, you've got to solve the people issues too, and I believe that's true with a lot of the rest of the world. That where people are more challenged and don't have a refrigerator full of food like we do. This is part of the whole uh, Crane City in, in Baraboo, Wisconsin. And, and, uh, and, and it's a wonderful place to visit. And it's the only place in the world where you can hear 15 species of cranes in the spring uh, with their mating calls. Talk about a raucous bunch. <laughs> good fun. I mentioned to one gentleman and he said, you know, is anybody doing good forestry somewhere and doing it well? And this is the Menominee Indian Reserve in northern Wisconsin. After that decimation of what happened to our own property, I took my wife and the two of us went out to see George. Uh, three things, and this is the second one that I want to tell you about. The Menominee Indian Reserve is on, guess, on which side of that line? <laughs> <laughs> and they have been cutting the wood for 140 years on that property. Everything that the wildlife that lives in Wisconsin needs is there and they're making money. Now that apparently can't be done here. I don't believe it. It's a case of being lighter on the woods, this industrial strength forestry thing. 
The other person I went to go see, actually I went to see the Aldo Leopold Foundation because if you've ever read much about conservation, the San County Almanac is almost a, a bit of a Bible. And George took me over and it turned out there was a meeting at the shack and, and George's friend Nina Leopold, his oldest daughter, was there. And we got talking and the next thing she said, let's leave this meeting, let's go to my home. So George and, 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 uh, and I and, and Nina went back. She died two years ago in May. Um, she was in her nine, she was 90 when, I, when, I took, when George took that picture of the two of us. The reason I mention this is that we went back and we talked about what was going on in Nova Scotia. Somewhat like what I've done here today. But you know, I left and we discussed it and when she talked about all these things, and I'm a member of the Aldo Leopold Foundation, I felt like, okay, you can recognize your problems, but there's things you can do about it. And I felt good leaving that evening discussion. And I want you to feel good that there's something you can do today as well. Am I going on? I'm just about done. Is that all right? So I hope some of what I've... Once in a while, things get through to me, Bill. <laughs> and I hope some of what I've said today has made some sense with you. So thank you very much for having me. How do you want to carry it from here, folks? I, I, yeah. Are there any questions? You can have comments, too. <laughs> when you were protecting your trees, you said you used the electric fence post because of the zinc? What? I used them because they've got a zigzag in them, if you go to a hardware store, and you can push, put, hook the wire through in a way that it keeps the wire down. And they're expensive. Uh, I buy them in bulk and get them for two dollars and something each, but it takes three or four of them depending on how you do it. But the other th good thing about it is, is that I'm using the same stakes that I've used for 25 years. If you, I've tried wood and they rot, so so it's it's actually I think the last time I bought them I bought twelve hundred dollars worth. But uh, it's not easy to get this thing going, but it is going to last. It's going to look after itself, like I said. Yes. Actually, what I'm going to do, uh, I, I've started, I don't like talking about things I haven't done, but I have started a book on what we've done to try to inspire people. Because I think a how-to book is something after. I think what we've got to do here is turn this whole forest thing around. And we can do it because half of the province is privately owned, small private woodlot owners. And, and if one of you goes home today and does something a little different, then this trip will have been worthwhile for me. And I suspect you're already indoctrinated because of Billy and, and, and a few other <laughs> folks that have been around here. But, uh, but I, 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 yeah, I, I'd, I'd be happy to come up with a second one as to how to. Yeah. And I'd be first to admit that I don't think anybody, I don't have all the answers. And, and, and the challenge is to, to provide, I mean, Steve Harder's been around here and doing different things for quite a while. And we've talked about this stuff for years. And, and there are a lot of... I don't believe that I'm the only person that can come up with this and there are other. Some of the grow tubes, actually the trees act like they're in a little greenhouse until they get to the top. And then they're almost like too soft. So there are some people, uh, one of the nice things about being the chair of the model forest was we got to compare a lot of techniques. And I, I really firmly believe that, that if you have a group of people that have taken on challenges, you can get a better story out of the bunch than you can. So, so I'm going to start off with a story here. And... Uh, and, and, and then hopefully inspire people and then be able to talk about how to later. I certainly see a few people here today that I'm hoping ask questions. <laughs> and there's some interesting uh, people in the room here, so mm -hmm. we'll certainly save some time here for questions. And, and Besides that black walnut, what other species have you planted or would you recommend planting to prepare for climate change? Um, I have uh, bur oaks from the St. John River Valley. I think they're going to do well here. Um, I've got four species of pines. I do get the odd exotic just because I just, I'm just interested, but I, uh, I've got western cedar doing quite well. I have about almost a hundred black ash that I'm trying to get going again. I think they'll grow in a good site, not just a swamp. Like uh, they're, uh, They grow along riparian areas along the streams and rivers. So um, I've got a list here of the 43, but uh, 
basically, I, I, I tried, if you look at Nicholas Denny's stuff, walnuts may have been here. He wasn't sure whether they were walnuts or not when he saw them around Digby, what was now called Digby. But uh, butternuts, he may have mis mistaken them for butter, uh, butternuts for them. So, but there are other, uh, I mean, things like red, a lot of our trees are resilient. It's just, I'm more focused on getting the original species back. But, but walnuts are doing very well because you don't get that, the, lead, the bud, the terminal bud at the top, doesn't frost bite as much as it used to when I first planted them in about 1982. And they're about this big around now. So, yeah, it's never too late. There's a fellow I know uh, who started a sugar bush when he was 95. <laughs> now that's an optimist. <laughs> 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 yes. Could you take us through just briefly how you turn that, that wet area into a pond again? Because I'm really interested in that. Um, the, I don't know whether I could go back to it, but no. <coughs> just, yeah. uh, would you like me to? Well, sure. Just kind of uh, how you started it, uh, what you did. The back hole. I, I basically took the, first of all, I had to get a, 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 a permit. Although in this particular case, they told me that I didn't need one. In the previous one, I had received a permit. Um, but DFO came out and looked at the site and said, this is just an old field. Why do, you, why do you have me here? That's exactly what she said. And I said, well, it's not going to be an old field. And she said, well, there's no fish habitat here. You don't need a permit. <laughs> so I built, the, I built the island because basically I wanted to, to have a little bit of protection for nesting birds uh, away from the raccoons and whatnot. Uh, we designed the island with, uh, uh, or the whole pond, I'm sorry, with a deep zone for winter uh, so fish could live under the ice, and they do because I watch uh, uh, otters dining on sea trout in, in February. Uh, and, and then we had a, 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 another zone. My, my wife is a, was a, a, a lifeguard, so she wanted to, to have uh, 220 feet of, of essentially Olympic-sized pool to swim back and forth in. Unfortunately, there are water scorpions, there are aquatic giant water beetles this big now, and, and, and there are leeches and all these things that she doesn't spend as much time, she'd rather walk on the water, than which she can't do, than, than go through. But anyway, we designed the thing with a seri three different levels, and, and, uh, and we designed it lengthwise across the way the water was draining down. So the long side was exposed to, to the area that had been trampled. And so it basically came in from the, from the west, this side. This is looking south. And then the brook, actually this, or, uh, this organized the water and the brook all flows out in one spot, which is how the fish come up from the harbor. There's about five species there now. So uh, um, then I introduced some, some, some of the native plants, like I said before, and, and, uh, and just let nature take its course. So. Oh yeah, the vernal pools. The vernal pools yeah. yeah, I'm not sure where that is in the rest of the. But, but you were saying something about testing it by. Yeah, what I did was I dug a test hole. But there's a vernal pool right there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You can waste a lot of money. Like I, to give you an idea, I spent about fourteen thousand dollars to restore much of what you've seen here. So you can waste a lot of money, and, and if you wind up with a type of soil, if you dig down to a sandy layer or a gravelly layer, next thing you know, you don't have a pond. You don't have anything. So what I do is, I mean, if you don't have a backhoe like I do, get somebody with one just over, if they're doing something else on your property or if they're nearby, get them to just dig a hole where you want to, where there's a damp spot where you think you might have. And then the other thing is, you do, if you drive around the, this province, you'll see ponds sitting out in the middle of, of open fields. Mm -hmm. Well, the wildlife won't come. You need a place for them to come where they can be hidden. And that's what I did we, there, and even this one too. But in this particular case, I dug a small, small hole. We washed it for two years, and then we brought the, the thing. They, st vernal pools by nature will dry up in the summer, but it's just a waste of money if they stay dry year-round. <laughs> so, so in this particular case, it was interesting because there is a clay soil. There was a, about an hour and a half after the, a, after the back hole, or the, the excavator left, there was something just popped out about this far down on the side of the pond where he left. There was like a, a garden hose f worth of, of water. There's a thing called telluric water in, 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 the, 
in, in some soil types where water runs under, underground in little channels. And in my wood lot, it's like that. You can actually hear water gurgling in the woods after heavy rain, and it drains through. And, and we, we tapped into one of those, and, and it does a really good job of... Uh, it, the whole pond filled up. It took about a month for the big pond, and that pond filled up in less than 24 hours. So. Oh, there. I like muskrats, but they can uh, actually they drained a pond on me, and they will. Uh, so what you do is you 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 put the berm if there's extra soil. Like I was hoping my neighbor actually would uh, would build a new house because his house floods, and I offered him. I said, I'll dig another pond for you, so you can build your house on a on a pile of because this stuff's fun. Uh, but if you put the put the the spoils from the digging really close, then the muskrats will live on. So the trick is to keep the water the the level further away. It's not so much of a problem where there's only stagnant water, but, and I also got to say there's this whole business of, uh, I talk too much, I realize, but this West Nile virus, this, this mosquito thing, I started this all up when they were telling people to get rid of water. And you know, we can sit on that dock where the otters were, and we have a dragonfly population that's unbelievable. And they strafe everything that comes near you. And I'm not saying there are no mosquitoes, but I have less of a problem with mosquitoes with a functioning ecosystem than I do with them breeding in, in, in water and tires and nothing else around. So, any, I saw another hand back there. Yes, Steve? Bob, you mentioned that the problem isn't on the right track now. What should the problem be in terms of forest? Don and I wrote 46 pages of what we recommend, and guys like Neil Livingston said that that if we, if, if I don't believe in going down in history, but that the government ignored our thing at their peril because we did have an ecological bent. There are people within DNR who have been trying for many years to get that eco forest ecosystem classification thing implemented. Um, and I mentioned to Peter Neely two nights ago that I hope that he gets that going. Um, we got to back off, and I don't think the government will do it and let, until the public tells them. And I feel sorry for the people that are working in the system that they're in now, in the woods. But someday I've got, I've got, I've got oak trees that I've nursed up through that disturbance forest canopy so they're not all branched out. And that tree's going to be worth a small fortune to some of the walnuts too. And, and I, I think as private woodlawn owners, we're going to be okay, but I think it's a race to the bottom. And I don't know how, um, if they'll ignore 110 different groups coming to have a press conference and then march in the legislature. Uh, I think the next election may do it. It's the same with open pen salmon aquaculture. The science is there. And it shouldn't be done if you value wild stocks. But, and they ignore it at their own peril. And I don't mean to threaten anybody, but uh, I'm, I'm really... Uh, it, to my mind, Steve, the root of this is that industry and, and government are too close on a number of environmental issues. And if, 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 if there's a buck to be made, but you're going to degrade the environment, that seems to be the way they're going. We've got to turn that around at a whole bunch of fronts. Because the reason we want to live here is that we've got, to, got something going for us in the woods. Yes, so Hilda. that whole voluntary planning process, do you think that was a waste of time and money in terms of what? I don't think it was. I don't think it was. It, it, it's like what Don and I did, and I haven't got, there's no time to go through all the recommendations we made, but we went, because of that very slim 86 thing, we went through and made a 116 different recommendations as to how to turn this around. Because motherhood statements was all the industry wanted, so they can just ignore them. But, um, but sorry, I got off on another bit of a tangent there. I didn't quite finish. You, you're quite. Yeah, it's a, it's a matter of record. And I don't think the government has performed well with what was done, but they did get rid of voluntary planning, as you might recall. That was part of the whole issue. Um, there are people working in DNR that were there when I started in the 70s. And they're the changing, they haven't changed and their thinking hasn't changed. And that's part of it too. So, uh, yes, Bill. Just I have one quick question. Do you think there is still a level Let's say 25 years ago, there's still a level of manipulation or propaganda ongoing in the government and you know with industry today that kind of masks things for the private woodlot owner. Yeah. 
Did, did, could you kind of expand on how that looks today? Has it just gotten a little different? Or, you, know, you know what I'm saying. Yeah. Because there are, there is the private woodlot over in the province now. They and perceive the, pro the propaganda and a lot of what's taking place, maybe even in some meetings today. Yep. After what we did, there was a thing called the Woodbridge Report that came out to evaluate the phase two panel thing. Mm -hmm. And Peter Woodbridge actually at one point said that we needed a fourth pulp mill in this province. Mm -hmm. That if we turned the whole province into uh, uh, plantations, we could probably do that, but we wouldn't have any substantial wildlife area left at all. So I... <laughs> No, I'm afraid I'm at a stage and I'm a little frazzled right now. I'm just trying to think of how I can fast very quickly <laughs> deal with it. That's part of it. Yeah. And the only good forest is a pile of wood like the front of that mm -hmm. thing. And, and uh, the, the whole process that they've gone through, they seem to have uh, industry just steering the bus. And what I tried to say there, and then I use an analogy because it's more polite, is that we need the bus driver. I don't want to be the bus driver. I'm not pretending to be the bus driver. I just want somebody else to give different orders. And we've got to slow down. We're not making any money in the woods in a lot of these things anymore. So Wood Woodbridge said four. Um, Ed Bailey's writing in the latest Atlantic Forestry Review that, uh, uh, you know, he's the guy that used to do all that. He's, you know, what's wrong with even age forestry? Um, there's a lot of thinking now, I'm insulting a lot of foresters with what I've just said today, and I don't know how many of you are here, but uh, uh, we were t you were taught that the only good tree is a tree that's being processed. And, and they didn't have to think about the public, but particularly with Crown Lands now, what they're trying to do on the private now is get you to sell your wood yes. by giving you a million, putting more money into the funds yes. to access it and whatnot. Yeah. It's... Yeah, and let's face it, there are people that aren't well off in this province that have wood lots that yeah. cash them in. And the, the perception is that the problem is us, the woodlot owners that won't sell. Mm -hmm. And I don't consider that to be a healthy no. attitude, really. Yes? Uh, can you give us a, a preview of what you're thinking of that would inspire people? Well, I, don't, I guess I should let, personally, Personally, I think that a lot of, if I started talking, if I had spent this whole time since 2 o'clock talking forestry jargon, you'd be so far under the table by now mm -hmm. that, but the fact is, those forests are actually habitat for a lot of animals. And to my mind, animals are almost easier to care for, Charlie, and it means you have to care for the forest. Now, I like trees. When I started off, I didn't care for them. But they're just like people. Every one is different. They communicate with each other, and I'm not going wonky on you here. They really do. When there's an insect infestation, the, the trees communicate that. They have other ways of, 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 of telling each other. And anyway, the, the, the whole system, um, I'm thinking right now, and, and there is some discussion about how to proceed on, on this whole issue, and, and I think wildlife is key to, to healthy forest because I think you can appeal to the public with, with, with animals. Does that make any sense to you? Yeah. Because some of this forestry stuff is so technical. Shade tolerant trees. What does that really mean? I mean, you know, it's uh, it it does have meaning, but it kind of goes over your head fairly quickly. Ron. Ron, well, there's so much that's happening out there that we sometimes don't appreciate. And I wondered if you could speak for a minute to the vernal pools and mm -hmm. the uh, movement of salamanders to those pools. Um, kind of in terms of the timeline and what's happening and encouraging people to go out with their flashlights and... Hey, you know the answer to that one. <laughs> Pretty soon, if the snow ever starts to go away and even while there's bare patches and the sun's getting stronger, you know, this is the time of year if you've got a wet spot around where... where uh, I actually see them, because I'm bermed into the side of the hill, they come walking by the bedroom window, slowly going down to the, like, like blue-spotted salamanders and, and uh, there's a whole bunch of things that, that live in Nova Scotia and, and of course you all know spring peepers but there's a variety of other frogs and uh, 
and Ron's right, I mean, this, this wood frogs that actually turn into a frogsicle, they, they can freeze and they'll thaw out and they, they have a sugar, <laughs> sugar level in their blood that would kill us, but they burn off going down to the pond to find a mate. And, and it all happens while well, most people are still feeling it's cold and damp out in the woods, but if you take a flashlight and get into that pond, starting sometime probably next month, and just monitor it. I can't tell you exactly when it's going to happen, but there's a migration to those ponds, there's a breeding period, and then a lot of the animals that, 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 that wind up breeding there wind up back off in the woods. You get, you get green frogs and things that stay there. And uh, There's even a newt that, uh, that lives underwater, the adults live underwater, they have, they have eggs, the young come on land and they're brilliant red with spots. It's called a red spotted newt. And, and they wander around for a couple of years and then they go b and be an adult back underwater again. And they're kind of fun too. So, so anything you need to add that I didn't cover, Ron? Oh, that's great. Just encourage people to go out and do it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, find out what's on your land. That's part of the whole thing. And, and we're still finding things on, on, on the property, which is really, really fun. Well, look, it's, uh, I bet your bottoms are all kind of getting stiff. Permanent press posterior. Um, Any other questions? Uh, one, yes. development doesn't become part of the, the reality of Nova Scotia and that when I was listening to the first depressing part of your presentation I saw so many parallels um, yep. uh, you know with the you know ignore the science I mean forget that you know it's all driven by industry but ignore the science and just you know and no sense of, of perspective of what's actually going to yeah. balance out the short term short term few jobs pro money flowing in it's and so it just um it just reinforced how interconnected all these issues are to me because if shale gas development happens it fragments what forests we have even more the pollution has impacts on on wildlife not to mention people uh, and then it's just so it's so we we really got to develop yeah, we've really got to develop politicians with a long-term perspective. Yeah. We don't have them now. We have to develop them now so we don't destroy them. Yeah. There are honorable politicians, and I think we've got to work with the ones that we find. And uh, I don't envy them what they're doing, but there's too much short-term thinking. You're absolutely right. I mean, here we are trying to get that pipeline down through uh, the states when they're fracking so much down there that, that they've got all kinds of gas again. Uh, and and, the, and the, when I think of the pollution problems that are going to happen with the fracking, I wonder about whether Keystone is much to worry about at all, you know. But and then what's going to happen is they won't pay us much for the oil because they've already got lots of oil right now anyway. So the, I think common sense is a real problem with with some of these issues and and short term gains, and uh, and I, honestly, if I had those answers, I'd probably, you know, if they, yeah. It's like a lot of stuff in wildlife. You wind up, people want 25 word or less answers when in fact it's fairly complicated. I, the key is that, and I, what I said earlier was, usually a, 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 a majority that's a minority in a group that are vocal can do this. Now when, the, when that doesn't work, and there are enough of us concerned in Nova Scotia that I think these things should work, then it's time to change the government and find somebody who will. And the last time we had an election, there wasn't anything to talk about. It was jobs and, and, and health care. The environment's got to get on there, and you've, they've got to state their position and then stick with it, you know. And if we all have to pay a little more for something, then... So I, I, there's the, I believe there's a light at the end of the tunnel, and it's not a train. We just have to be together on it, and we have to make ourselves loud and clear and have a reasonably unified voice. So, 